from downtown Detroit. Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Broad daylight, two armed masked men bust into this longtime Detroit business, kill the owner, even after he did as they asked. Terror in Austin. We are clearly dealing with what we expect to be a serial bomber at this point. A community's worst fears realized as a fourth explosion overnight injures two people. But first, could the old Detroit train depot be ready for a second act? Tonight, we've learned about a massive deal in the works that would breathe life back into this iconic building. The Detroit train depot in Corktown has served as a beacon of blight for decades. Could soon change, though. We've learned Ford Motor Company interested in buying the building and moving in. Business editor Rob Maloney live in Corktown tonight. And Rod, there have been rumbling something big might be coming. This would be that big. I can tell you over a month ago, Devin, I got the first little inkling that something could be happening. You start asking around, you kick the tires, people don't want to say anything, and it took a while. But today we were able to confirm that Ford could be changing the game here. And it's one of those things that tells us that Detroit's comeback is genuine. For a generation, the old Detroit train station, visible as you come into the city off of I-96, stood as the shining example of Detroit's former greatness and ongoing decline. You could see through it all the way to Canada as it sat decaying in the elements. Then in 2015, they started putting in windows to make the place look better. But at the time, everyone wondered what would become of this stately old relic. It's taken three more years to get to that decision. But today, without directly saying so, Ford is winking at its involvement in not only occupying the old station, but in buying it as well. Here's what the Ford statement put out this afternoon says, quote, we're excited about our return to Detroit this year with our electric vehicle and autonomous vehicle teams relocating to the factory in Corkdown. Now, last December, Ford did announce that it would bring its smart tech team to this old factory that it once owned on Michigan Avenue. But here's the enticing part. Take a look at this video of the factory. Do you recognize the building in the background? Local 4 News has confirmed that Ford is doing the due diligence to buy the old train station and move more of its smart tech team in here. Here is as far as Ford was willing to go today on that part of the story, quote, while we anticipate our presence over time will grow as our AV EV teams move downtown, we have nothing further to announce at this time, end quote. Now, Rod, of course, Matty Maroon owns the train station. What are you hearing from the Maroon folks about this? They're, they're not willing to say anything, Devin, as a, as a sort of standard operating procedure. But here's the thing. Uh, Ford looking to do this tells you a lot about the size of its automated vehicle program, because if they're going to be putting people in here, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of employees. And if, in fact, that's what they end up doing. Again, it hasn't been a signed deal yet, but they're looking at it very seriously. Uh, this could be a very big big game changer for yeah. this neighborhood. It's going to be absolutely riveting to watch. All right, Rod. Kim. Well, he's been in business for years, but tonight the 60 year old owner of Metro Corps on Detroit's west side is dead after two masked men broke in and demanded money. Let's get right to Mar McDonald. She's live at the scene on Coyle Street and Mar police say he gave them what they wanted and they shot him anyway. Exactly, Kim. He he gave them the money they asked for, and one of them turned around and shot him. But let me set this up for you. This is MetroCore. They sell used auto parts, like a lot of these small businesses here, here in this very small industrial area, which is bordered on one side by the freeway, the other side by a neighborhood. This is not a place with heavy foot traffic. This is one of those places that you don't even know existed unless you know who these people are. Uh, our officers received a run uh, uh, late this morning here. 11 a.m. MetroCore, like the other used auto parts businesses in this industrial area, was open for business when police say two armed, masked men came right through the front door, demanded cash, got it, and on their way out, one turned around and shot the owner. The victim was shot at least one time in the chest. Uh, he was conveyed to a local hospital uh, as a uh, gunshot wound. Uh, was fatal. The owner, who was described as a man in his 60s, was not alone inside. His son was there as well. So there is a witness and there are cameras all over the property. Police have video. You know, he was a good guy and it just, it should have never happened to him. Williams and his father did business with Metro Corps. They, like everybody in this small area, are stunned by what happened here in broad daylight. It shook up those who work at the other businesses, so much so they don't want to be ID'd on camera. Oh, he was generous, kind. It don't bother nobody, you know what I'm saying? He mind his own business. 
And you sit out here in front of this shop sometimes just, just sit and chill. Back here live, you can see some of those cameras on the Metro Corps building, but these other buildings in this very immediate area have cameras on them as well. Police confirm they've got the video. They're reviewing it. Uh, we'll see what comes from that. We're live on Detroit's west side. I'm Mara McDonald, Local 4. Just horrible. All right, Mara. A Detroit police commander is suspended after an altercation at a bar in Corktown. Commander Timothy Leach was working security inside a Tavavia on St. Patrick's Day when he allegedly tossed out 41-year-old Michael Karpovich. Well, Karpovich's attorney says as a result of that altercation, Karpovich is unresponsive with skull fractures, a bilateral brain contusion, and is on a ventilator. The investigation goes on. Firefighters on Detroit's west side rescue an elderly man from a burning house. Fire started just after 2 o'clock this afternoon at a home on Dexter and Montgomery. 70-year-old man was trapped upstairs, and a brave neighbor took a ladder and tried to get in the home to help. That's right about when fire crews arrived to make the rescue. Cause of the fire still under investigation, but good to report that the elderly man is expected to be okay. Police in Austin, Texas have confirmed what residents have been fearing. They believe a serial bomber is on the loose after a fourth explosion overnight. Take a look at this map of these explosions around the city. These have all happened in the span of 16 days. Jay Gray in Austin tonight with an entire region on edge. Jay. For the fourth time in three weeks, an explosion has rocked the city of Austin. We are clearly dealing with what we expect to be a serial bomber at this point. The blast overnight left two young men with serious injuries, though doctors say they're not life-threatening. This has to be a deranged person. The string of attacks that began on March 2nd killed 39-year-old Anthony Stephen House as he picked up a package left at his doorstep. 17-year-old Draylen Mason died. His mother was hurt as they opened a package inside their home. And a 75-year-old victim was severely injured when she moved a package left on her front porch. We're a community right now that is, that is pretty anxious. So are federal agents. 500 FBI and ATF agents are already on the ground with more on the way. The entire national apparatus of the FBI is focused on this. A focus that is shifting now after last night's package bomb was left along the side of a road, not a doorstep, and was triggered by a tripwire. It just shows another level of sophistication uh, by the bomb maker, and that concerns us. The violence is getting worse instead of better. And the tension is growing across the city as well. It definitely changes the way you feel. And the way many go about their daily routines. It will till it gets to whoever did it. We never lock that door and just visit back and forth. I will now. I'll make sure all the doors are locked. Concern, just like investigators here, about where and when there might be another attack. The first three attacks were on the east side of the city. Last night's was in this community to the west. The random nature of the attacks adding to the frustration and fears of so many here. Jay Gray, NBC News, Austin. All right, Jay. Eastbound I-94 at Harper in Macomb County has reopened after a vehicle fire there this morning. It all happened just before 1030. The cab of a semi truck caught fire, forcing all the lanes to close. The left lane reopened at 1230 after crews got the fire under control. But the middle and right lanes, as well as the right shoulder, just reopened a short time ago. No injuries were reported. Emily City Police are searching for a 19-year-old wanted for making threats against the high school. Colin Owen allegedly went to school to confront someone but fled when police got there. Police say he stated he had a knife and intended to harm someone. The teen has several warrants for his arrest. Police believe he is armed and dangerous. The Utica Community Schools District is placing resource officers at Utica and Eisenhower High Schools. Part of an ongoing partnership with the Shelby Township Police Department, these officers will be assigned to local high schools on days when school is in session. District in-house security specialists currently assigned at high schools are going to support junior high and elementary school buildings in Shelby Township. And today, the Utica High School student charged with making a threat was in court. Timothy Evans is charged with making a terrorist threat. Yes. Our Priya man spoke to Evans' attorney who says this situation has just spiraled out of control. 18-year-old Timothy Evans hasn't been back in school since being charged with making a threat of terrorism. He was in court briefly today with his mom. His attorneys say the allegations against Evans have been exaggerated. 
Very simply, there is a major difference between stupidity and criminality. Wearing a dark suit and flanked by his lawyers, Timothy Evans faced a judge. The senior is accused of making a credible threat against Utica High School. We want the entire public to know is that at no time whatsoever was there any danger, physical danger, to any student at Utica School or for any other school for that matter. His lawyers say the teen posted a video on Snapchat handling a starter pistol. I don't think uh, anything that he ever expected himself or his family would go through. The deputy chief says when Shelby Township Police searched Evans' home, they found multiple firearms and replicas as well as ammunition. Police became aware of the social media post earlier this month after students and Evans' classmates came forward. Kudos to the to the to the parents of the of the of the young students who went out there and and said they saw something. I mean that's obviously what we want in the society. But what we have to be careful of is that we don't start going down that slippery slope where we start overcharging. The teen was arrested hours after police were tipped and later charged with making a terrorist threat. The Macomb County prosecutor says calling a threat a prank or a joke is not a valid defense. Evan remains on a tether and under house arrest. He'll be back in court in April. Reporting from Shelby Township, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. Okay, Priya, and if convicted, Evans could face up to 20 years in prison. As more Metro Detroit teens face charges for threats of terrorism, we cannot say this enough. Officials are urging parents to talk with their children. Yeah. We are off and running on a Monday. That we are ahead of the next hour. Why Uber? is pulling all of its self-driving cars off the road effective immediately. And we'll show you what happened today in Florida that's aiming to ensure that something like that tragic bridge collapse never happens again. Hi there, Polly. Yeah, hey there. I'll tell you what, Kimberly, we have nothing going on around here. We've had lots of sunshine, a few high, thin clouds coming across the border, but just down south of this, a big severe weather outbreak in progress, and that's just going to miss us. And then we have the first day of spring to talk about. We'll have all that in the forecast for the week ahead, just ahead. The Macomb County Clerk in Port Huron today to take on the county yet again. We'll tell you why we're here and if her job is in danger. It's must new at six. A local mother accused of leaving a child inside of a car faced a judge today. I'm Larry Sproul. I'll tell you the punishment she's now facing and what's next for her. An elaborate phone scam stretching from Michigan to the state of New York ends with two arrested here in Metro Detroit, but police say there could be more victims. All right now here at five, the latest court battle between Macomb County and its clerk, Karen Spranger, found its way to St. Clair County due to conflicts with the local judges. Jason Colthorpe is here now, and Jason, this is the big case in the many legal fights that are going on right yeah, now. Yeah, there's a bunch, and this is the big one, guys. This is the county's counter suit challenging her residency. It's being handled first because if the county wins this and she's shown the door, well, everything else is moot. In a St. Clair County courtroom, a spirited back and forth between Karen Spranger's attorney, Frank Cusimano, and the county's corporation counsel, John Shapka. For about 45 minutes, they argued two motions, one by Spranger asking for a dismissal of the county's claim that she lied on a sworn affidavit about where she lived. Clerk Spranger's defense of her residency presented here today basically hangs its hat on one sentence within the statute that deals with the actual definition of the word residency. And her attorney is using case law going all the way back to 1876 to prove her point. And that basically states that a person's residence is their residence as long as they intend on coming back to it at some point. Just because a person's poor doesn't mean they can't run for office and hold office. The county presented evidence of low water usage at the Hudson address in Warren to prove Spranger didn't live there. Karen Spranger admits that she was at hard times and she was impoverished at the time. That's the reason why she had no water service or electrical service at that address. The bigger picture here in the eyes of the clerk is this is yet again the county going after someone unwilling to kowtow to the unions and the other groups that have held power there for years. There was a tremendous amount of resistance to Karen Spranger. She's the outsider. I compare her to someone bringing a stepchild or, or something into a family, and she's like, who the heck are you? You know, what are you doing here? Why you don't belong here? The county's motion basically is asking for an immediate decision here. The judge will issue that in two weeks, which could be granting one or the other motion 
or it could grant neither motion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what if it's neither? Sure. If it's neither, they go to trial, which is what Karen Springer would and like. The county's it. confident yeah. in that, but she'll get her day in court then. It's just one piece of all this, though, still. A, a the biggest big piece, yeah. but, but yeah, there's Depending other how, moving parts. How it falls, yeah. 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 Okay, Jason, thank you. Well, if you, you are paying more for the gasoline you use as you try to drive around potholes in Michigan, AAA Michigan says the average price for unleaded gas currently stands at $2.62 per gallon. That's actually up four cents from what we were paying just a week ago. It's still well above the two dollars and thirty six cents per gallon that Michigan drivers paid for gas just one year ago. Paul Gross in for Ben tonight. You know, yesterday was so nice. I actually left basketball for about an no, hour. No, you did. I you got did outside not. for about an hour. I know. I know. I, I was a, it was a little weird for me, but I did. Uh, it was really lovely. It was uh, the weekend sure didn't disappoint. Yeah. I mean, it was just spectacular. And if you can just make that timing on the weekend, then we're all happy. But <laughs> now right. we're back to reality so and back to work. Again, here we right. go again to look at these numbers compared to 24 hours ago. Some <laughs> areas are 20 degrees or more colder than it was just yesterday afternoon at this time. Yeah, we had the sunshine today, but it was cooler sunshine. Look at this Pontiac. You're 17 degrees colder than it was. Now, if you're wondering what that actual number is, well, here we are. Temperatures now, this is actually quite interesting. We've had an east wind today, so you see the Lake Huron influence with these bluer, darker blue colors. You can see extending all the way toward Flint, where you're in the 30s. Then Monroe County, just kind of creeping into the county here, you're in the 30s. But then in between, we got into the low, even the mid 40s in some spots. Again, all that sunshine, great. Just a few thin cirrus clouds, a few more of those down to the south working their way in and further south. Very dynamic storm. This is going to move eastward and just miss us to the south. Down here, quite a risk for severe weather. And we're not just talking about the amount of severe weather. We're talking about the intensity. There is the potential. Look at this. This is a moderate risk for severe weather. That's number four on the one to five scale. And you can see that we're not just talking about amounts. We're talking about possibly long track tornadoes. Very damaging, very destructive tornadoes. So that's the focus today. Tomorrow, that area shifts south. If you know anybody in the north, northern half of the Florida Peninsula up into the coastal sections of Georgia, South Carolina, even southeast North Carolina, uh, still quite a strong risk for severe weather. So a very dynamic system, but here we are. Nothing going on, just uh, basically just some of those high thin clouds we talked about. Those will be in and out, so mostly clear tonight. You might not even notice some of those clouds. And through the day tomorrow, just keeping the sunshine with some of those clouds. Now we do get a bit more in the way of cloud cover later in the day, so becoming partly cloudy. Mostly cloudy tomorrow night, and then by the time we get into the afternoon hours on Thursday, we'll start to see those clouds break up, and we're going to get back to some sunshine, So, or as you say, Wednesday. So basically, uh, we're quiet not only through tomorrow and into Wednesday, but wait till you see the seven-day forecast. So 23, the overnight low tonight, it is going to become breezy. So uh, just you'll notice if you're an early morning jogger tomorrow, you'll notice those breezes with the, with the temperatures tomorrow in the 20s. 40 or so for the high tomorrow, breezy sunshine becoming partly cloudy. Now check out this week ahead. You're not going to see a raindrop here. Let me just bring in the other seven days here. Look at this. You're not going to see a raindrop here. The only close call we have is Saturday. Another storm just like tomorrow's going to pass us just to the south. And right now it appears it's going to miss us, but any further north and we get some snow out of that deal. But unfortunately, temperatures stay in the low to mid 40s. The average high right now is in the mid to upper 40s. So uh, a cooler start to spring, but it's okay. It's dry. We'll keep the sun. Still got that countdown clock on. 18 hours, 55 minutes, and 14 seconds until spring. Well done. Not well that done. we're counting. She's no, been, we're not counting. She's been on it since the first day <laughs> I of know, winter. I don't <laughs> <listen to it. laughs> Let's check in with Dr. McGeorge. Well, when an Ohio mom got the flu, she turned to over-the-counter medications to ease her symptoms and suddenly ended up fighting for her life. Coming up, I'll show you the critical mistake that she made and how you can avoid it. All right, Doc, but first, do you recognize this man? What police in Wayne say he did that has neighbors on alert, and that's coming up next. There's Nadine. Oh, my God. Where are you? Families of the missing work hard to keep their loved ones' cases in the spotlight. I just want to bring her home. A sister's quest for justice, tomorrow, starting at 5. Police in the city of Wayne are looking for a man in connection with an indecent exposure case. Investigators have released a photo of a man who may have been involved in a case of indecent exposure and sexual assault. The incident took place last Friday evening near Michigan Avenue and Elizabeth Street in the city of Wayne. Take a good look there. If you can identify this man, call the Wayne Police Department. The ride-hailing service Uber 
has suspended all operations of its self-driving vehicle experiment after a pedestrian was killed. She was hit by an autonomous Uber vehicle. Happened Sunday night in Tempe, Arizona, just outside Phoenix. Police say the vehicle was in autonomous mode. It did have an operator behind the wheel, but that's when it hit the woman who was crossing a crosswalk. Uber is cooperating with police as the investigation goes on. A barricaded situation at a Gross Point home ends peacefully after a six hour standoff. Authorities had the house surrounded since 1.30 this morning after being called to the home for what they feared was a suicide situation. Family members were home at the time, but they were able to leave and get to a safe space. The suspect surrendered and is now getting checked out at an area hospital. Nobody was hurt. The first lawsuit has been filed in the Florida bridge collapse at Florida International University. There will be more than one, no doubt. The plaintiff was biking to work when the bridge collapsed, causing severe injuries. Miami-Dade police have identified all six victims who were killed in the collapse. The bodies of five were trapped in the rubble. They were removed over the weekend. Eight other people are still being treated for their injuries. New at 530. In cold blood. A nine-year-old boy accused of shooting his own sister. And you won't believe why police say he did it. President Trump unleashing his most direct criticism yet of the Russia investigation, calling out special counsel Robert Mueller by name. A new interactive tool to check on the conditions of the roads in Macomb County, but why this tool is actually more about funding than it is road conditions. It's people. There's a new way to steer clear of trouble on the roads. Macomb County is going digital to keep drivers in the know when it comes to construction. Today, Macomb County Executive Mark Hackle launched a new interactive system. And it shows drivers, current road conditions, and the estimated cost of road projects. But as Nick Monticelli reports, the reason behind the tool is to highlight how underfunded road improvements really are. County Executive Mark Hackle was on the campus of Macomb Community College talking about this new interactive tool, and it is pretty neat. But as you heard, there essentially is an entirely different motivation for it. It's so you can see how much he says the roads would cost to fix and why he says Lansing is failing us. Macomb County crews were putting more Band-Aids on today to make our roads temporarily tolerable. And you can find those road conditions on this new Macomb County interactive map showing in red which roads are in poor condition and how much it will cost to fix them. That's essentially the purpose of this map for County Executive Mark Hackle to send a message that he needs about $1 billion to fix all of this properly. He says it is so bad some roads, even bridges, could be closed. They need to be concerned. And again, at any point in time, that could be a problem. So we are monitoring constantly. Uh, we have our road folks out there, engineers, that are making a determination as to, okay, do we need to close this particular road? Do we need to close this particular bridge? The only other thing we can do is start to bring all these roads back to gravel. Hackle blames the Michigan legislature for not coming up with the funds to fix these roads. Does the legislature have the appetite to come up with new money to solve this unbelievable crisis? One option is to raise taxes, but one lawmaker says, not at the state level. Proposal one failed. So people clearly were not excited about the idea of paying additionally, have it going through the state system. I agree, the, the state system is broken and people voted no. If the question is if people want to make a greater investment, then maybe some of that needs to be on a local level investment so they know that money is actually staying on the roads in their community. And some of those local communities see that too. If there is not going to be new money, they might have to jump in. If it gets to that point, we're going to have to come up with some kind of method to line up the funds, whether it's Shelby Township, City of Warren, sitting in Sterling Heights, um, Clinton Township. You're going to have to come up with some method to fix the road because it's an issue and it's going to continue to get worse. At Macomb Community College, Nick Monticelli, Local 4. All right, Nick, and the tracking tool is live right now on the county's website. An endangered missing advisory has been issued for a 13 year old in Warren. Alyssa Catherine Golding was last seen in the area of 12 Mile and Shaner walking to school. She's described as a white five foot, 200 pound female with blonde hair and blue eyes. She was at last wearing a black puffy knee length coat and neon pink hoodie and black and white Nike gym shoes. If you have any information about her whereabouts, please call police. Is special counsel Robert Mueller on the president's chopping block? That scuttlebutt now after President Trump issued his most direct criticism yet of the Russia investigation, calling out Mueller by name. Today, the president's team insisting despite the tweets, Mueller is not going to be fired. 
Blaine Alexander is in Washington tonight. Good evening, Blaine. Well, hello to you from Washington. President Trump has repeatedly attacked the Russia investigation. That is not new, but some say that by adding Mueller's name, those attacks have now become more personal. President Trump, for the first time, bringing Robert Mueller into a Twitter tirade by name, raising questions about whether he will fire the special counsel to end the Russia investigation. Should Mueller be fired? The president, ignoring shouted questions about his latest series of weekend tweets, referring to the Mueller team and the Mueller probe that should have never been started, he writes and insisting the team of investigators is comprised almost entirely of Democrats, though both Mueller and his supervisor, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, are Republicans. That to me is just incredibly dangerous and shameful that the president is using his pulpit, his position, to attack law enforcement and this investigation. President Trump has previously said that he will not fire Mueller. No, I'm not dismissing anybody. His attorney insisting that is still the case, but more questions after Deputy FBI Director Andrew McCabe was fired by Attorney General Jeff Sessions just hours before McCabe's retirement. What the president and his lawyers are trying to pursue is a discrediting campaign against anybody that's a potential witness against him. McCabe dismissed after an internal report found he authorized the sharing of information about the Hillary Clinton investigation with a reporter, but was not forthcoming to the inspector general. McCabe says he is being singled out for supporting his former boss, fired FBI director James Comey. And McCabe's firing comes just hours before he was eligible to collect his federal pension. Already at least one congressman has offered him at least a temporary job in hopes of saving it. In Washington, Blaine Alexander, Local 4. All right, Blaine. Meantime, former FBI director James Comey got into the fray on Twitter saying his story will be out very soon and the American people can judge for themselves. Tampa police have arrested a man they say shot an officer. It happened just after 2.30 this morning. Police say officers were serving a warrant when a 35-year-old man fired at them, hitting one of the officers in the arm and torso. The suspect allegedly surrendered after his mother told him to put his weapon down. This could have been much worse. Uh, we're very fortunate. I think it's clear that we have a problem with uh, mental health issues in our country. And, you know, this is just another example of what our officers deal with every single day out there. The officer who was shot was treated and released from the hospital. The shooter has been charged with two counts of attempted murder of a law enforcement officer, as well as the charges in the warrant. Police in Montgomery County, Maryland, which is just outside of Washington, D.C., say four people were hurt in a major freeway pileup this morning. It was before dawn when a semi changed lanes on I-270 and slammed uh, into a car. The car hit uh, slammed on its brakes to avoid the truck. That set off a chain reaction involving 20 vehicles, including three semis. One of those trucks hauling sheets of slate lost part of its load. The truck that started all of this kept on driving and police are still looking for it tonight. Police in Northeast Mississippi are investigating the shocking case of a nine year old boy who allegedly killed his older sister because she would not give him a video game controller. Police in Monroe County, Mississippi say the nine year old boy found a gun in the family house and then shot his 14 year old sister in the back of the head. She died later in the hospital. The children's mother was in another room at the time. As of now, no charges have been filed. A Texas couple is charged with cruelty to animals after neighbors saw them sacrificing animals and then called police, but they're saying it's all a misunderstanding. Robert and Irma Talamantes have both practiced the African religion of Santeria for nearly three decades. They say they were in the middle of a ceremony for a new member that involves blood sacrifices to saints when police arrived. We had the animals, you know, in, in cages and, you know, inside the bags, but they weren't being abused. We're not beating animals to death. We're not, we're not chopping off legs, you know, while they're still alive. The group sacrificed a goat, three roosters, a pigeon, and some chickens, and had other animals ready. They believe their mistake wasn't the sacrifices. It was leaving the garage door open for the neighborhood to see. Across Michigan tonight, we're following stories from Grant Township and our state capital in Lansing. But we want to start in Flint. That's where the U.S. Supreme Court has given the green light to two lawsuits filed by people over the water crisis. The appeals court previously ruled that a federal trial court had improperly thrown out federal civil rights claims in those lawsuits. The trial court ruled the Safe, water, Safe Drinking Water Act 
precluded those claims, but the appeals court disagreed. The Supreme Court has declined to get involved in the cases, meaning those lawsuits can move forward. Moving over to Grant Township tonight, where authorities are investigating the death of a bald eagle. The Department of Natural Resources say the eagle was discovered in a tree on March 1st and was the victim of a traumatic injury. Michigan State University is assisting in the investigation by performing a necropsy as well as lab tests to try and determine the eagle's cause of death. The DNR is asking anyone with information about how it could have happened to please come forward. And in Lansing, Michigan is ramping up security for midterm elections. It follows the national concern over reports of Russian hacking efforts in 21 states during the 2016 presidential election. All of Michigan's election equipment has been replaced since then, but it, it has an added precaution here. The state will now hand count ballots in all precincts chosen in the post-election audit. It will take place during this year's May election and November general election. Well, today, the next generation of entrepreneurs got a chance to show off their hard work. It is all part of the Michigan Invention Convention over at the Henry Ford in Dearborn. Our Kim DeGiulio was there and shows us what makes this event so inspiring. Here at the Henry Ford, we celebrate the innovators of our past. But today, it's all about the innovators of our future, as today is the first annual Michigan Invention Convention. And by the looks of some of the projects that I've seen here, the future sure is bright. The event brought out more than 100 students from southeastern Michigan, ranging from 3rd to 12th grade. We were really kind of blown away by student entries. The goal was for the students to come up with an invention that would solve a problem for somebody. These two seniors from Skyline High School in Ann Arbor wanted to help gardeners. We decided to use the data to uh, send alerts to gardeners about the conditions of their plants. To do their research, they set up a weather center on the top of their school. So this is on top of Skyline High School, right? Yes. Here. They let you do that? Yeah. yeah, we went up on the roof a bunch of times. These fourth grade students from Parkview Elementary in Novi wanted to solve the problem of stray animals harming humans. So they created this device. So basically the button would be right here. You would press the button and it would give out this ultrasonic sound. Which, which humans can't oh. hear. All of the inventions I saw were so well thought out and creative. But the best part of the event was the excitement all of the students had for the chance to use their imagination to make the world a better place. There will be three winners that come out of today's convention. And those three winners will be welcomed back this June for the National Invention Convention. Do you guys think you can make it? Yeah. yeah. I think so. <laughs> Reporting here at the Henry Ford, I'm Kim DiGiulio, Local 4. All right, thank you, Kim. <laughs> Awards are given out by grade level and award-winning inventions have ranged from a shovel with an attached measuring tape to lollipops that cure hiccups. These are real inventions. We Way can use that. Way more advanced than my moldy bread. <laughs> <laughs> one, that's right. Remember yeah, that one? Did that. Everyone did that. I'll tell you, Doc will be doing a story on that hiccup tour in a few years. <laughs> Keep it up, kids. Well, we know chip cards take a little bit longer to check out, but it's all in the name of security. New tonight, what the experts are saying when it comes to keeping your information secure. And some thieves were caught red-handed by police. New at 5.30, why when it came to the getaway spot, they chose poorly. Hey, Doc. Hey guys, you know when an Ohio mom got the flu, she turned to over-the-counter medications to ease her symptoms and soon ended up in the ICU. Coming up, I'll show you the critical mistake that she made that could have cost her her life. Some protein. New at 6. Potholes here in Metro Detroit are nothing new, but potholes mixed with a dirt road, that's something neighbors have been facing for years. And now simply want some help. Car shopping in the internet age is all about checking out the vehicles and doing the research before you go to the showroom, but people are getting tired of just having to do that. They want more, and it's coming. We'll tell you where. In good health tonight, when an Ohio mom came down with the flu, she turned to over-the-counter medications to ease her symptoms. And many of us do that, mm -hmm. but she ended up needing a new liver to survive. Our Dr. Frank McGeorge is here with a cautionary tale for everyone. Doc. Well, this is a big deal, Karen and Jason. You know, Tylenol, NyQuil, Theraflu. Stephanie Soriano wasn't taking anything that unusual, but she made the critical mistake that quickly turned into a life-threatening situation. 
from the drugstore aisle to the ICU. When Stephanie Soriano got sick in January, the busy mom says she just wanted to knock out the illness so she could keep going. I was taking um, Tylenol during the day, um, towards the evening as well. Uh, then at nighttime for bedtime so I could sleep. Um, I would take NyQuil. Um, then I would wake up around 2 to 3 in the morning um, and take Theraflu as well. It eased her symptoms, but Stephanie didn't realize the products all contained one common ingredient, acetaminophen. After several days, she began to feel worse, and then... I was coming in and out of conscious. Um, I wanted water very badly, but I couldn't make it to the bathroom or to my kitchen um, to grab anything. Unresponsive, Stephanie was rushed to the hospital. Doctors determined she had unknowingly poisoned her liver and would need a liver transplant. So Thursday night is when they put her on the list. We, they told us all the worst case scenarios about it could be months, it could be, you know, we might be able to find a match. But incredibly, a matching donor was quickly found in Philadelphia. Stephanie is grateful to the donor family that gave her a second chance. It's a gift like none other. Um, I've always been an organ donor myself. But you never really sit there and think that s such a big ordeal can definitely happen to you. Now, in general, acetaminophen is safe and effective, but too much can damage liver function. In fact, a recent study found accidental overdoses are more common during cold and flu season when people are, in fact, taking the multiple medications. I'm surprised it doesn't happen more often. Yeah. Well, what is too much in terms of taking these medications? Right. So the FDA actually recently adjusted that and lowered the daily limit just last year. And the guidelines recommend that healthy adults take no more than 3,000 milligrams or a gram of acetaminophen products in a day total. Now, adults with liver problems or if you're a heavy alcohol user, you should talk to your doctor because your daily limit may actually even be lower than the three grams per day. But it's easy to get up to that yeah. if you Scary. add up all these products and then take some extra strength Tylenol on top of it. And you think you're not mixing and you really are. Exactly. Thank you, Doc. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, pay phones still exist mm -hmm. and people still use them. According to the FCC, there are 100,000 pay phones throughout the country and about a fifth of them are all in New York. Uh, that number may seem pretty high, but it's nothing compared to the 2 million pay phones that were around in 1999. And uh, like we say, people are still using these because owners reported $286 million in revenue in 2015. But experts are still predicting the end is near with more low-income Americans turning to prepaid cell phones.